I want to talk about a real case that has to do with the application of uh, communication for power systems protection. And I will uh, stay very much on the, on the top, but I want to outline some principles that allow us to go beyond that what we knew from the past. And as we learn it in, in the courses for a presentation, we first make an overview slide that you have here. Uh, we will go after we have seen some principles uh, that are applicable for wide area communication in particular into a real case where we have been involved uh, two years ago. And I want to make you aware that uh, a new game is on that allows us to do better things than we did before. We had uh, protection communication uh, for a very long time. We will just see what was the classical case and what we have in the future available. What you see here on this picture is uh, very roughly uh, what we call in 61850 dash 90 dash 1 which cares about substation to substation communication we called it the gateway approach and more or less uh, the classical teleprotection devices uh, implemented this gateway approach what does it mean you have a selection of data here and you have a very typically very limited channel between the substation and you do, do need uh, to make some mapping between the data that you have here, how you put them over the wire, and how you bring them back to the other side. And every time you change something here on the information exchange, you have to go into the communication equipment and change the mapping so the communication equipment is fully aware of the information you are exchanging in a very detailed way. Uh, that is what we call uh, the gateway. Typically in the past, these channels were <coughs> not very performant. Often they could carry only a couple of bits. It was either a power line carrier or something with SDH or something like that. Uh, in the typical case, this equipment was always very specific to the application and it was typically also not interoperable, so on both ends you had to have equipment uh, of the same kind uh, that communicated with each other. And this was actually uh, the, the state where the project, uh, which is explained later, started. And then, already for a while now, we have this very neat concept of the goose available that provides all the information uh, from the protection devices, at least in the substation, and immediately the question came up, can we carry this information over to the other substation, for instance, for teleprotection? And yes, people mastered this problem very quickly. Even before we had the 61850 goose, there are some known examples where people tunneled the goose messages over a wide area uh, communication path uh, to another site. And what you see here is an approach where you have some intelligence, for instance in a router, that uh, takes the goose on one side, wraps it into an IP packet, sends it over, on the other side it gets unwrapped and republished, and so we can bring over the goose message over uh, an IP route through an IP network. Uh, but here still, uh, those devices have to match somehow uh, because this wrapping and unwrapping is still some kind of legacy, but it's, uh, and also uh, there is a mapping between this goose message and the wrapped goose message, but it uh, opened the scope and allowed to do some things that we could not do before. In the meanwhile, we got some other possibilities. One of them is <coughs> MPLS that allows uh, the engineering of layer two paths 
through a wide area network. And so the goose can directly travel from one end to the other one uh, without, so to say, explicit wrapping. Of course, this MPLS network does something with the packet to bring it over. But for you, uh, as, a, as a user, it looks as if you have a big local area network. And this is the case that we will refer to later on. Those technologies uh, are very performant and uh, very elegant uh, from the way uh, you can use it. Nevertheless, uh, you need to have certain preconditions like such networks in place to be able to use it. There is a new concept coming up. It is the routable goose, or abbreviated the R goose. Uh, you better get familiar with that term. You will hear that in the future probably more often. Uh, where we also use an IP network, which is typically much more common than these engineered MPLS things. And the, the routable goose is directly generated at the IED itself. So it's an IP packet which is sent out from the, from the publishing IED and it is then sent over the IP network and you do not need any specialized communication equipment to do that. And this is very charming because uh, the applicability is even much wider than with the options that we had before. Now let's look into a case where these principles were really applied. It is a 110 kV system, not a very large system, I must admit. It's, uh, it spans over 20, 25 kilometers. It was upgraded. Uh, in, in requirements with that uh, upgrade with the protection system came and there was also an upgrade of the IT system which happened independently and could be used uh, with, uh, with very much benefit for the whole system. So a goose based system was <coughs> set up for the teleprotection and of course uh, there was a commissioning made where I have the one or other word to say. So that was the system where everything started. The main thing uh, was the protection between those two feeders here. Uh, there was this legacy teleprotection stuff involved. Uh, it was working over SDH, but believe it or not, there were only four bits on this teleprotection channel which were exchanged between these two devices. Those teleprotection devices were getting old. Bottom line, they couldn't get any replacement parts uh, uh, anymore for it, so they had to get rid of it or replace it. And uh, something else has happened in the meanwhile. Oh, sorry, this. This formerly not so important feeder here, uh, got a lot more of loads and infeeds, so it was finally necessary to upgrade this to a kind of a, of a substation to a, a fully supported bus now with, uh, with breakers and a real modern protection relay, but still this relay uh, as it was a digital relay state of the art but it had no goose interface. And on the other hand, uh, there was the desire to keep these relays here in place, not to exchange the relays and make this a new performance protection system where this feeder has to be included into the system as well. Now what has happened in the meantime, uh, the, the corporate IT department has put in place a completely new corporate IT system which was based on MPLS and uh, the IT guys were very cooperative which is 
as I heard it, not always the case for the protection guys. And uh, it was possible for this protection engineer to ask uh, for some, some paths to be engineered between those sites. And so he got uh, the possibility to run boost messages between these substations. And now what did he do? As none of these relays had a goose interface, he added a binary to goose converter and ran the goose messages between these converters. That was, was his concept. And then they asked us to assist them in the commissioning. And we said, OK, that's nice. We will bring a lot of our toys there. So here, at these three places uh, where we had this MPLS uh, communication, we did not only bring in protection test sets, but we also brought our recording devices so that we could record all the events in, in the system. And here are some some other feeders uh, that we also included in the protection test. So this was a distributed protection test where all those five protection test sets were simultaneously controlled. And uh, in parallel, we did all the recording of the 61 and 50 traffic and, and other uh, events that were going on in the substation. Here is a picture of uh, my colleagues. You should recognize one face uh, that was involved in this. Uh, and I, I was really happy to see uh, how, how this was performed in, in a very efficient way. Uh, Björn, are you here? How long did it take? Uh, Björn isn't here. Oh, a day? A day of preparation? Um, yes, it was uh, started at 9 o'clock yeah. with the setup of the whole system, but it was also changing the old channels. And the first test shot was around 7 p.m. But then the whole test was done in one and a half hours. Okay, as always, more preparation than real work. Good. Now here one of these measurements that we did during this commissioning. Uh, it was uh, just uh, recorded during one, one of these protection scenarios. You see there were uh, not a huge number, there were 17 boost messages going back and forth for on, on a distinct line. And uh, there was uh, the propagation delay uh, that was measured was in the one direction was about 300 microseconds. So you see how performant these networks can, see, uh, can be. And between two other stations, uh, it was about 400 microseconds. I ask you to, to uh, keep this uh, roughly 300 microseconds in mind. Uh, they will uh, show up in the next uh, figure again. So just to illustrate uh, how, what the coverage of these measurements were, so uh, Talking about the results of the protection test that would be another presentation of an hour. There were some interesting observations made how this protection works with the weak in-feed and everything on the one side. But I will skip all of that because we will look more here into, into the communication side of the problem. So for instance, one relay was sending out a pickup or, or, or a trip command uh, that was collected here on, on the binary side, it said at the banana plugs, we did the, the recording, and then this state change uh, was converted to a goose message, which was also recorded on this side, by the way, these devices were time synchronized. Uh, then the goose goes over to the other substation, is received here again, and then it's converted back into the binary status to be fed back to these old-fashioned relays uh, that, that needs 
uh, a binary input again. And here you see the timing. Uh, we have the conversion from binary to goose, which is very much influenced by the filtering of the binary input. And then it is sent over to the other end. And you see here, you have here this 300 microseconds. And then the information gets uh, converted back to binary. And this is a little bit more than four milliseconds. And most of this time is uh, the binary relay contact acting. So uh, the electronic processing in between is not the major contributor to this transfer time of 6.6 milliseconds from one end to the other. And you see, really, when the network is performant, it can be the least contributor in this timing balance. Now what have we seen? Uh, things have, have changed. Uh, there are a lot of new preconditions. We can, we can make a lot out of this performance and make some better protection systems. And just to outline that, uh, I will give you a comparison of some figures that we have collected over the last 18 years, I must say. Uh, this is, these are measurements uh, from the 1990s. Uh, we have documented them in publications as well. So this first example uh, was made here in Germany and Jochen was present at that measurement. Uintrop, Neden. Yes, I was Yeah, there. you still remember that? Yes. Yeah. We didn't have so, so much gray hair at that time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, it was an end-to-end -end test of a line protection, and it was the first time that we made through this end-to-end -end test this timing explicitly visible. First, there were just estimations from the conversion times from these modulators, how much time it would would need, uh, we could then measure it. So this is one benchmark, roughly 60 milliseconds over 120 kilometers. Then at about the same time, uh, I was present at the measurement uh, in, in Vienna. Uh, this was also an end-to-end -end test. And here we have this about 40 milliseconds over four kilometers. And here we have some measurements that were done in the last two years uh, where we used IP traffic over the internet. So we need to say that these communication channels here were not even optimized or specialized for protection applications. They are uh, very good and very performant channels for office communication but you could probably do even better than that. But we got here, this is uh, our, we, we ran this test 9,000 kilometers between Austria and Texas. Yeah? So there is no protection system that spans over this area. But just to take it to extremes, we looked uh, into the case when we go uh, over thousands of kilo kilometers what timing will we get? And we are well below 100 milliseconds in this case. So you see, we are here timing-wise roughly in the same ballpark. Uh, but the distance has gone roughly up two orders of magnitude. And here we have just the same case. With the same timing range, we have here about 100 times more of distance that we can cover or vice versa. If you go over the same distance, you can be much, much faster today. And I have summarized this here in, in this diagram. Uh, when you take the figures from the 1990s, they are up here in this corner. And the other figures, those are here, over the wide area network, 
then you have another area. These are these 300 microseconds out of this protection system example that I just showed you. Uh, we, we moved into a different area of this diagram. Why isn't this shaded? Any, any idea? Yeah, about this line is the speed of light. So we will never get here. Not with the physics that we know today. Uh, nevertheless, we, we, have, we have this move down here that allows us a lot of things that were not imaginable in the past. We just have to rethink the things we are doing. And when I heard Alex saying, oh, now the distance protection will not work anymore under this or that circumstances, uh, it always rings the same bell with me. Distance protection makes just too many assumptions. And today we cannot rely on these assumptions anymore. And for me, distance protection is a system that has to go away. Yeah? It was, it will all, it's always emphasized uh, that it can work independently only from the measurements from one side because we don't have the information from the other side. Now we are doing communication. We are working with the information from the other side and we can do some better things. I think differential protection uh, should become the standard and distance protection maybe the backup as it is already the case in many high ranked power systems go to Japan uh, distance protection is probably uh, not the most popular system over there it's different I think here in Germany distance protection is, is very very popular uh, but as I said it makes too many assumptions which will not be longer met by our systems and so we have to move away to something better and this communication features give us the possibility to do that. So what have we seen here? I gave you an example what you can reach when you consequently use the options that you have today. That it was especially the achievement of one very smart person who, who had the right view on the problem, who had uh, the intelligence to discover what, what he uh, can do, who had, and this has to be mentioned again, a good support of his IT department who really made it possible that he can, could implement that. And uh, with all these preconditions, he could make a very efficient and performant system that was easy to set up and to maintain. And when you would now go uh, to this utility and ask one of those management people if they had already taken the decision to go for 61850, they would tell you, no, we don't do 61850. But they are running who's already in there and don't know it. Yeah, so the game is on. We're in a new era. We just need to take the options that communication provides and make something out of it. And the rest of this event uh, is dedicated to the topic. That's more or less what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, please, I'm ready for it.